Okay, it is 51 o'clock. Now, what is 51? At its core, 51 is a toolkit for helping you build high quality data sets and high quality models. It helps you to visualize, clean and curate your data, find hidden structure in that data, evaluate model predictions on your data sets and different subsets of your data sets. And its design philosophy is all about flexibility and customizability. So 51 is all about giving you the power to explore and understand your data, uh, regardless of your specific workflow or machine learning pipeline. Now, what do we mean by curate? Well, we mean filtering, matching, sorting, and selecting your data in whatever way you would like. So here in this example, in, in the uh, GIF on the right, you can see a visual of in the app sorting by uniqueness. So this uniqueness is something we'll talk about shortly, but basically it, it allows you to get a measure of which images or which samples in your data set are most unique in that data set. So you can sort by uniqueness. You can also, as we see here, you can filter for high confidence predictions. So it's going to show this in a second. Here we were filtering for confidence above some threshold. And this is just a small subset of all the things you can do with filtering, matching, sorting, and selecting in 51 that allow you to identify specific subsets of your data set that are of interest to you, whether those be problematic or edge cases, or whether those be highest performing samples or something else. You can also clean your data. And one of the things you can do with cleaning your data, uh, which we'll get to in a second, is removing duplicates. Um, here is another example of filtering and matching and sorting and selecting. So uh, we can uh, search for all the labels that have airplane. Uh, so we're searching for all of the images that have an airplane object in them. And we can identify all of those and just look at those. Uh, so if we want to clean our data, we can remove duplicates. So here uh, we can actually identify all of these duplicates in our data set and tag them as such so that we can then go either delete them or do some modification to our workflows in the future. And 51 has capabilities in it uh, to help us to identify exact duplicate images, approximate duplicate Im images, and uh, approximate duplicate objects. Uh, you can also identify spurious labels. Um, and you can identify uh, poorly performing samples and things like that. You can also add to your data set. So you can add tags. And here we are filtering for, we're basically taking the 10 most unique samples in the data set and we are tagging those as unique. Um, so we are adding the tag unique to each of those samples. We can also add metadata. We can add predictions from certain models. We can add whatever else we would like, basically. 51 is incredibly flexible when it comes to all of this. And everything we've done so far has been done graphically. It's been done through the graphical user interface of the 51 app. But you can actually do all these things and a lot more in code. And we'll talk about that and, and get to that soon. You can also correct your data. So uh, if you have labeling or annotation mistakes on your images, if, if you have um, misaligned bounding boxes or incorrect labels on classifications or things like that, you can correct those. You can, uh, here we tag them as mistakes so that we can then send those back for re-annotation in the future. Uh, you, can, you can do many things around correcting mistakes in your data set. And once you've identified subsets of your data that are of interest to you, whether those be problematic or otherwise, when, once you've concatenated all of these different filtering, matching, sorting, adding, removal, and correction operations to your liking, you can then save all of this so that you do not have to reproduce all of these steps of logic the next time you want to look at this subset of your data. And so in this example, we can see uh, somebody is saving this specific view into their data called has people. And then if, in the future, if they want to, uh, they can, in the unsaved views box, they actually uh, will be able to, uh, do the, go, to go to the drop down, and there will be a new view there. Um, and they can click on that. And that new view has people uh, will take them back to the view into their data that they were looking at when they saved it. Now, beyond curation, we also want to understand our data. 
And one of the ways that we can understand our data is through aggregate statistics. Uh, so here in, in the visual, we can see there is a histogram. So we have histograms of the label classes uh, of all of the images uh, in the data set, all the objects in those images. Uh, and we also have other aggregations, all of the traditional aggregations that um, are supported and you would expect to be supported, uh, like the minimum and the maximum, uh, the mean, uh, standard deviation, all of these things for numerical quantities. You can also extract a list of all of the raw values or all of the unique values in the data set. Another way that we can understand our data is through embeddings. So embeddings are uh, numerical vector representations of certain aspects to, uh, of our properties of our data. And those help us to understand our data in a lot of different ways. They're, they're kind of the multi-tools of machine learning. And here, using dimensionality reduction techniques, we're visualizing embeddings on our data. And then we can actually select some of the, those points in our embedding plot. And we can see in the sample grid on the left, the images corresponding to those points are then um, populated in the grid. And so this plot is interactive and allows us to interactively explore our data. Here we see this cluster corresponds to food that is plated. But this, these embeddings also help us to find hidden structure in our data. So one example of this is the Berkeley Deep Drive data set. Uh, and so here we've taken a bunch of images from the Berkeley Deep Drive data set um, and we have plotted embeddings for those images. So these images are taken during the daytime, dawn or dusk, or the nighttime. And on the left in the embeddings plot, again, using dimensionality reduction techniques, we have plotted these points, all of these images and then the points corresponding to them, uh, and colored those embedding points via the label of when they were taken, whether that is daytime, nighttime, or dawn or dusk. And we can see that they very roughly actually cluster. Uh, so the daytime images have embeddings that are in one cluster and the nighttime images have embeddings that are in a different cluster. And we also have other little clusters that are interesting as well. So we have a cluster that corresponds to images with rain on the windshield. We have a cluster that has a very pronounced dashboard and so forth. Uh, so this can help us to identify hidden structure that we may not otherwise be aware of. And I'd also like to point out that all of these visualizations have been and are interactive. And that is a key component of 51 as well. So we can see we are um, lasso selecting different points in our plots uh, in the in confusion matrices, as we will see shortly. Uh, you can actually click on different cells or entries in the confusion matrix, and you can have those entries populate in your sample grid. And this, this is a key characteristic of 51. So Another interactive visualization is if you have location data for your images or for your samples, you can actually select geographic regions and see all the images that were taken or that correspond to those geographic regions. Uh, interactivity is, is key. Um, and speaking of things that are interactive, it's time for a pop quiz. With embeddings in 51, which of the following can you do? The answer is you can pre-label data and you can find likely annotation mistakes. So if you think about the Berkeley Deep Drive data set that we looked at before, and we'll just go back for a second so you can check this out again. Because these two sets, the daytime and the nighttime images, clustered the way they did, we could actually, even if we didn't have those labels, we could just by selecting and looking at the examples in those clusters, we could get a rough sense for what the labels are. And we could roughly pre-label the images in one cluster as being daytime and the images in the other cluster as being nighttime. This is not going to be perfect, but it will give us a very rough pre-labeling that can save us time and money. Uh, additionally, in order to correct annotation mistakes, let's say that we did have some labels that we uh, procured for, from some labeling service, uh, and we had a couple of for instance, yellow points in a red cluster, we might be suspicious and we can look at that and uh, check about if it actually is a daytime image that's surrounded by nighttime images. And if so, 
why that is. Uh, is it actually an edge case? What's, what else is going on in that image? Is it uh, maybe a poor lighting image, something else? Um, and we can really identify and try to correct these labeling mistakes. But this was also a bit of a trick question because you can also send annotation jobs with 51. Uh, and we have integrations with Labelbox, Label Studio, Scale, and see that all your favorite labeling providers. And you can also integrate 51 into your fine tuning uh, pipelines. So you can integrate 51 with your experiment tracking tools uh, in order to train and, and, and uh, produce better models. You just don't do these things explicitly with embeddings. Okay, and here's one more pop quiz. With embeddings in 51, which of the following can you do? All right, and the answer is A through D. So you can find similar samples, search through images with natural language, search through object patches, find the most unique samples. All, all of these things are supported in 51 via embeddings. So the two examples I showed you at the very top of the hour with looking for specific dogs that were like the initial dog image or looking for images that resembled a birthday scene, uh, both of these things used embeddings on the back end. Now, you can also find near duplicates in 51 using embeddings. And this is very similar in its essence to finding uh, similar examples. So uh, if the images are approximately duplicate, then they will have very similar in embeddings. Uh, and you can actually, if you sort by similarity or search by similarity, then you will get very similar scores for both of those. You can find exact duplicates in 51 as well. We have uh, utilities that allow you to do that. Those just don't use embeddings. Now, another component of understanding our data is evaluating. And evaluating is a key component in many computer vision workflows. So 51 has support for tons of one number metrics, precision, recall, F1 score, intersection over union, you name it, uh, plotting, so all of your favorite plots, PR curves, confusion matrices, um, and confusion matrices and things like that are also interactive, as we've mentioned. Uh, and you can also perform analysis on the level of samples, labels, and data sets. So an individual label, whether that's a classification, a detection, or something else, uh, a full sample, whether that's an image, a video, or something else, and the entire data set. So here in the visual, we can see uh, we perform some detection evaluation, and then we sort by the number of false positive detections in our data, it, our data set. So we look for images that have the most false positives. Um, and then we look at those and inspect those images uh, and dig into the false positives. And here we can see another visual of the confusion matrix, and you can click on this one cell in the confusion matrix and you can see all of the examples that have a person that was correctly identified as a person. So 51's design philosophy is all about flexibility and customizability. And everything I've mentioned so far, uh, whether that's curation, understanding, evaluation, any of these things, uh, 51 has some flexibility surrounding that because we know that Computer vision is not a one-size-fits-all solution field. Everybody comes to computer vision with their own data sets, their own conventions, their own labels. And our goal is to provide you with the flexibility to perform your evaluations and to perform your operations in order to understand your data and curate better data sets. So, to that end, you can bring your own data sets, so you can define your own custom schema. We, we have support for that. You can also use one of a one of dozens of common computer vision data set formats, and you can either load common computer vision data sets directly from the 51 data set zoo, or use importers or exporters and convert between formats very easily. You can merge and add to or clone data sets. Uh, and on the, the right hand side here, we have a bunch of different data set formats that are supported. And the same flexibility extends to models. So you can either bring your own model, and we support PyTorch, TensorFlow, 
sklearn, whatever machine learning backend you prefer, uh, or you can load models from the model zoo. And we have many of your favorite computer vision models in the model zoo. Those are available for loading uh, with a single line of code. This flexibility also extends to media types. So 51 does not just support images, but also videos, DICOM data for medical purposes. Uh, we have point clouds, which can either be generated by uh, generative models like OpenAI's Pointy or via LiDAR scans or, or something else, uh, or even geographic data. Uh, we can also look at grouped data sets. So you can group samples, uh, whether those be all images or co collections of images and videos or images and point clouds or whatever different media, type, media types you would like into groups. For instance, if you wanted to group a bunch of samples that have different media type together to constitute a scene uh, that, for instance, gives you information about a self-driving scene. So you could have images from the left and right, uh, different stereo images, and you can have a point cloud representing three-dimensional information about that scene. The same goes for labels. 51 supports tasks related to detection, masks, classification, ac action recognition, uh, key points, relationships, and so much more. And if the built-in flexibility is not enough for you, 51 also supports a lot of customization. So here we can see a very basic example of customization. You can reorder different fields and groups in your sidebar within the app. You can add new groups, add new fields, however you'd like. Here's another example where you can add a new panel. So you can change which panels actually take up space in your app and how much space they take up and where they are located. And last but not least, we also have plugins. So the 3D visualizer that you see on the right here, uh, which allows you to investigate and interact with a three-dimensional scene involving point clouds and three-dimensional bounding boxes, is actually a plugin. And you can build your own plugins that allow you to create new panels within the app that display different types of behavior or new menu options. Uh, the, the sky is the limit here. I've given you a whirlwind tour of a lot of things that 51 does, a lot of workflows that 51 is involved in, but let's zoom out a little bit and orient ourselves. Where does 51 fit into your workflows? Where does 51 fit into computer vision workflows? So in a very deep sense, 51 is a link between your data and your models. It helps you to build higher quality data sets in order to build higher quality models. And you can bring data from whatever data provider in whatever format you would like, and you can work with models in whatever model framework you'd like. 51 is the link between them. And moreover, 51 is not just the link between your data and your models. It is also the connective tissue or the organizational framework for all of your computer vision workflows. Computer vision data is very unstructured, very inhomogeneous. Uh, you have baggage and you have labels and different formats and conventions from tool to tool. We know that 51 is likely not gonna be the only tool that you use when you're doing computer vision. And, and uh, you have pi pipelines that uh, involve production level computer vision. Uh, 51 is what will help you to organize all of this and to put it all together in a way that allows you to understand and curate your data and draw insights from it. Okay, so let's talk about notation for a second and uh, nomenclature. Um, so far, I've been talking about 51 and I've been fairly loose with the terminology. I've been using a bunch of things interchangeably, but 51 actually has three components in it. There's the 51 library, the 51 app, and the 51 brain. And together, those make up 51. Now, the library is the open source package, the, the Python package that you install. 
Uh, it is the open source framework, the core library. You might also hear it referred to as the Software Development Kit or SDK. And here on the right, we can see a code block where we are importing 51 and performing operations like creating a data set and adding samples and uh, matching tags and, and, and other things. Um, and all of this is using the 51 library. You can also think about 51 library as a debugger for your computer vision data. And speaking of debugging, let's debug your understanding with a pop quiz. All right, so where can you use 51? Well, all of the above. So you can use 51 in Python, so whether that's a Python script, the Python interpreter, or a Jupyter notebook, or, or another notebook. Uh, but you can also use 51 via the command line, and 51 has a command line interface. And if you're curious about this, you should check out our documentation page uh, on 51's command line interface. The 51 app is the GUI, the graphical user interface, the application, and it is the thing that we have taken all of these screenshots and GIFs from that you have seen so far in this presentation. Um, you can also think about it as a VS code for your computer vision data. And here's another pop quiz. Where can you view the 51 app? The answer is you can view it in a Jupyter Notebook, you can view it in your browser, or you can view it as a standalone desktop application. Now, this is also a bit of a trick question because while you can't technically view the 51 app within a Python script or within the Python interpreter, you can launch the 51 app from these. And the 51 brain is a suite of machine learning powered routines. It, it allows you to work with embeddings. It performs dimensionality reduction. It allows you to visualize the, these embeddings. Uh, I mentioned uniqueness before and mistakenness. The 51 brain has built in routines that allow you to work with these things and, and help you to understand and uh, really dig into your data more, more quantitatively. Now, everything I've been talking about so far is open source. So the 51 library, the 51 application, and the 51 brain are all open source offerings. And if you are a single engineer working locally on your laptop, then these open source offerings are likely just what you need. But if you are part of a larger team and you are collaborating with others on computer vision applications, well, then you might need 51 teams. And 51 teams is built on top of the open source offerings with the additional offerings and the additional capabilities of collaboration tools. Uh, it has native support for cloud-backed media, it has dataset permissioning, versioning, and management, and it's got built-in tools for collaboration. If you want to know more about this, then you should check out our docs page at docs.vox51.com slash teams.